My name is Cindy Ricca. I volunteer at the VA Hospital in Canandaigua, New York, and I do Veterans Histories for the Library of Congress. Today I'm here with George Haynes, and he's going to tell us about his time in the military. Go ahead, Mr. Haynes. Thank you. Um, well, my uncle had been in the World War I. He was a photographer in the Air, Air Force or Air Corps. And I'd seen all his pictures and we talked about it. And then came World War II, my brother got drafted. And uh, I uh, kind of biting at the bit to get in, so I discussed it with my parents and my dad wouldn't sign for me, so my mother said she'd go up with me. So I went up and I enlisted in the Army. And uh, that was in December 42. And my birthday was uh, in April of 43, and by May, I was up in Fort Niagara. And uh, I was up there for 29 days. One more day, if I'd have been up there one more day, I could have had 10 day leave. But well, we shipped out, and then we went down. We're heading for uh, Camp Wheeler, Georgia, Macon, Georgia. And we had a four hour stay over in uh, Washington, D.C and another uh, soldier and I went for a walk to see what Washington was like. And uh, we're walking around a library, I don't know which one, and uh, one of the uh, guards that were walking guard, he collapsed in front of us, just ahead of us, and we rushed up to see what we could do, and he was out. So the other fellow I was with suggested I put the leggings on and walk guard until he could figure out what to do. And of course, I was seen by one of the other guards on the other side of the building, and they asked what was going on. And I told them, and they took care of it and relieved me. And I had somebody come in, put took the leggings and the rifle, and went on <laughs> his way. But we went on down to Camp Wheeler, Georgia. And I went, uh, I, I didn't excel, but I was very good at the rifle range and the swimming and everything else. It all worked out real good. And I, not that I really enjoyed, but I, I did enjoy being in the service and learning. And I, uh, after basic training, I came home for about eight, 10 days and then went down, uh, headed for um, uh, Chalmaine Slip, Louisiana. That's where we went out. And we uh, shipped out of there after being down there for about three or four days. We went through the Panama Canal, which uh, <laughs> going through something so beautiful and never knowing if you'd ever come back again. <laughs> and uh, we stopped in Balboa, which is on the west coast. And uh, that evening, they had a air raid drill. And what had been palm trees during the day turned out to be guns at night. Really? It was, it was a just, uh, you're sitting there, suddenly the sirens and everything go, and here's these trees disappear. <clears throat> and uh, we shoved off the next day and went out uh, through the Pacific, and we stayed well south of Hawaii. Uh, they told us that if we'd, at night, if it hadn't been the war, you could have seen the lights in Hawaii on the horizon. But uh, we went straight into New Guinea. We got off at New Guinea for a day or so, and then they took us to an island called Good Enough. And we were there for, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe a week. And uh, it was a beautiful island, but we were getting used to uh, jungle life. And we had to go on patrol, not patrols, but uh, just uh, marches and get used to the jungle. And uh, then we went from there, we made the landing into uh, um, Hollandia, New Guinea. And, uh, and by that time, I had gone from a bazooka to a flamethrower, to being a scout. And uh, I had a Thompson submachine gun, which was my baby. 
I could take it apart in the foxhole and put it together again and clean it every night. And I always had plenty of ammunition. But well, we made the landing in, uh, landing in New Guinea and uh, we were advancing and we saw up the short distance ahead of us three poles in the road and uh, our company commander Pappy Pyle after we had found that was three three American nurses tied to the stakes or poles and one was dead and one died shortly thereafter and <clears throat> we immediately he told us it was a uh, slow us up tactic that the Japanese were using but he called for medics to come up and we advanced uh, we lost maybe five ten minutes and then we advanced from there to an airstrip that we had a secure, which we did. And but at Pappy Pilot said, when we, he says, "You've seen it. I don't ever have to tell you what to do." From that point on, we never took a prisoner. We made it a point, and uh, met a, uh, quite a few times we came upon. Uh, Japanese soldiers, and we just uh, literally shot them. We didn't even we didn't even go for souvenirs. We left them just there to rot. Mm -hmm. On patrols, uh, this other gentleman, uh, Manchester and I, who were first scout and second scout, we rotated. Um, at one point, uh, we lost a patrol behind us. They were too far behind us. They should have been closer to us. Mm -hmm. And he was first scout and I was second that day. One thing about scouting, when he was first scout, he always looked straight ahead. I, a second scout, looked up in the trees. They couldn't use too much of artillery because it exploded in the treetops. But you always had Japanese tie themselves in trees as snipers. Well, they never climbed a tree that went straight up. They always took the trees that went up on a slant. It was easier to walk up. So uh, we were pretty fortunate that we, we set this up between the two of us. The first scout, the first one always looked ahead. Mm -hmm. The second one looked up above, <laughs> and we always that close to each other. At one time, we lost our patrol, the eight, ten guys behind us, and uh, we ran into the jungle, and we ran quite a distance. We found an open area of high grass and we stayed there probably a couple of days until we heard the Americans because we had heard the Japanese talking so we were at night we stood up during the day we laid down in the grass mm -hmm. but the uh, Americans a couple of days later we heard them come up gabbing and talking and so we went back but we were supposed to be dead well here we are so uh, the, that patrol at that time didn't go in to advance any farther. They took us back to camp, mm -hmm. and uh, we we were assigned to another group. Uh, we went on patrols. Captain Pappy Pyle never sent us on a patrol two days in a row. If you went out one day, you had the next day of rest. Mm -hmm. He felt it was too much on you or whatever, but. You never went out two days in a row under any circumstances. The second day was your rest day. And uh, we, uh, after leaving New Guinea, we went to the Coral Islands and <laughs> we were told to dig in. Well, you don't dig in on coral. You would take and uh, chop off the uh, points and uh, lay down. But we weren't there more than a few days because it wasn't, the Japs had already left that. It was not that big an island. And uh, from there, our next big landing was in Leyte. And that, that was a tough one. And uh, nothing really, uh, they went inland. The Japs went far inland. And uh, at one point, we were advancing, I think it was in Leyte, I'm quite sure it was. And what the Japanese had done is taken these Filipino women and actually tied them to the tripods of machine guns and convinced them 
that we were going to kill them if they didn't kill us. And they were tied to these guns. And fortunately, when we landed in Leyte, we picked up some Japanese or Filipino um, uh, young lads that knew there could help us advance and everything. And they, in turn, talked to these women and told them that we were their friends and everything and not to shoot and everything. We didn't want to kill them. Mm-hmm. That was the last thing we knew. They were Japanese, they were Filipino that the Japs had forced into it. Right. And it was again, it was a, to slow us down. And uh, so the, fortunately for us, we had this Filipino boy and uh, they convinced them, the other, there was a number of them, but they convinced these women not to shoot and uh, so we could advance. But they tried all kind of tactics to slow us up. And every island you found something new. But uh, after Leyte, uh, Mindoro and Mindanao, I don't remember which order we went, but we hit both those islands. And they, they were just, that was like a mopping up of, uh, of the, the war. <clears throat> uh, I still, I uh, stayed as a first scout, so did Manchester, and uh, our experiences, we never discussed them at night, we, and they wouldn't let us sleep in the same foxhole, because mm. we had machine guns. So we had to be in two different foxholes, so we couldn't discuss anything. Mm-hmm. But we always, you were in with another soldier, and uh, uh, they wanted us in separate because we each had Thompsons. I uh, never had a small clip and I never had my Thompson submachine gun on a single shot. It was on always on automatic. And once I pulled the trigger, I was going to get rid of a lot of bullets. <laughs> on patrols, whenever we went on patrol, we, uh, if we used a clip at all, we dropped the clip on the, in the path, hoping that we'd come back the same path we picked that clip up. Mm-hmm. We knew if we got back to camp, we could get bullets, but we were never sure we could get any more clips. And I carried a strapped bag on both shoulders, and uh, I, I think there was a ten. I had ten clips in both bags, so I had twenty clips with me at all times. So did Manchester. We both carried plenty, and there was always plenty of ammunition. We'd go back at night, and we'd fill the clips right back up again. Did you have people bringing you ammunition when you were in some of these battles? No. No. I, I always, we both took enough with us. Mm-hmm. Now you take, you take 20 clips, but 40 rounds, I think it was 40 rounds in each clip. Mm-hmm. You got a lot of, a lot of ammunition. Yeah. Unbelievable. And it was never too heavy. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when we went on patrols, we never took backpacks. And we, we never talked. Okay. Okay, and uh, the Filipino women and families, <laughs> my father sent me uh, canned peaches and pears. He put them inside of a loaf of Italian bread and sent it to me. And these people, they never had had peaches and pears, and they just fell in love. So. Uh, where one of the islands, and I had a, the people insisted that I have dinner with them at Thanksgiving, our Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. So I had to get permission to leave camp and go have it with them because I'd given them the peaches and pears. And they'd, they'd killed a chicken, a couple of chickens. So uh, they were so grateful to have us there. Uh, when it come to digging holes or anything, to, there was always a Filipino man or a boy, somebody to do it because mm-hmm. they were just so thankful that you were there to, you were saving them, protecting them. Because even after, uh, even after the war was over, the Japanese on the island were still uneducated. Uh, even though they dropped leaflets, they still were in the fighting mood. Yeah. And uh, they they didn't they didn't believe that the country would never give up. Mm-hmm. But um, I then I went to Japan. I was on the island of Shikuku. And uh, the town of the Matsuyama, 
that's uh, Matsuyama. And uh, fortunately, I got into the kitchen and worked in the kitchen. And uh, every other weekend, the sergeant would get us a jeep and we could go around the island and meet people. We, the, the Japanese people in general didn't want the war. Mm -hmm. They were tickled pink that it was over. and so. Uh, and then I had, before I went to service, I had worked at Kodak, and I met a family who had a camera, one user, film 117. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a letter back to this gentleman who worked in the research labs and asked him if he could send me some film. So he sent me a few rolls of film and they gave it to the family. Well, that, that was the best, best, beautiful thing. They were so happy to get mm -hmm. filmed. They could take pictures. I, I had my picture taken with uh, their daughter, and uh, it, it was just, they were so happy, and they were, the people in general were great, wonderful. They'd give the shirt off their back to you. But then we, uh, time to come home, and we shipped out, uh, and we landed in Seattle, Washington. We stayed there a couple of days, and then we uh, loaded aboard a train, Canadian Pacific, came across Canada. Mm -hmm. And at every stop, the Canadian people were there with cookies, cakes, pies, anything you wanted when that train stopped. In fact, some of the soldiers got off and stayed and would hit the next train coming across. Uh, whether they got permission or not, I don't know, but I, I just wanted to get home. And uh, we came in Fort Meade, was it Fort Meade, or no, New Jersey, Fort Dix, New Jersey, I think it was. And that's where I got my discharge from. And uh, I came home from there into the station in Rochester, and uh, nobody there to greet you. I got into a taxi cab and they said, Charlotte, and I'll pay all fines. Well, that driver went down Lake Avenue, which was two lanes, and he never stopped for a light. In fact, we passed my mother standing waiting for the trolley car. <laughs> By the time I told him, we were two or three miles down. And uh, he brought me all the way home, pulled into my driveway, and I said, how much? He says, nothing. Thank you. And they even uh, wanted to carry my duffel bag up and put it on the porch. I said, no, I got it. So I went in, the house was unlocked, nobody was home. Turned the lights on and that scared my mother when she finally came home. She was scared that the lights were on. Mm -hmm. She had no idea I was coming home. And uh, from then on, life just, I went back to my normal life, working at Kodak. And. Uh, uh, I've just been lucky. I'm 90 years old. I've been a volunteer fireman, volunteer ambulance. I drove truck at Eastman Kodak. Uh, I was outside. I kept kept myself active all the time. I got into Boy Scouts. Went to summer camp up to Massawipi. Massawipi. Yeah, and uh, I've just kept. I retired. At 57, I retired the 1st of uh, March, and by May I was in the hospital volunteering. And I've been there, I'm in my 34th year now in the emergency department. And, and I hospital. love it. Well, I've, I rode an ambulance. I've had a lot of knowledge, and uh, mm -hmm. so uh, I, what I see, I don't see. I can go into a room upstairs, and the patient's on my left, and I go to a closet to get something. I don't see what's going on over there. Yeah. I go in, turn around, and make sure I don't even look at it. Unless they say something. A lot of times they want to talk, but they've got nobody to talk to, and they're right. lonesome. I'll stay up there. Uh, I go up and pick pillows up every morning and take a stretcher and go up the access pillows. Mm -hmm. And if they want to talk, I'd, I'd be glad to talk to them. Mm -hmm. And I cannot ask a patient if he's a veteran, confidentiality. Yeah. But all the nurses in the hospital know that 
if he's a veteran, tell George. George, <laughs> George can go talk to him. That's nice. So I do. I get a lot of. I've gotten a lot of veterans mm -hmm. to go on this honor flight. Mm -hmm. And I ask them when I do get them. I say, when you get up to the airport Saturday morning, I'll be there. Make yourself known to me. Mm -hmm. And they have. They've come over making themselves known because they look different standing up than when they're yeah. on the stretcher. Yeah. They're laying on bed. So yeah. yes, they do. Uh, in fact, May first. There was two of them came in, and uh, you remember me? I said, no, I'll be honest with you, I don't. You're going to talk me into going on this flight. Yeah. Well, World War II uh, veterans will go first. Mm -hmm. We get them on, so. Mm -hmm. And uh, I enjoy myself, and now I'm the uh, liaison between the veterans and the honor flight. What was your honor flight trip like? Uh, 30. Flight 30, uh, Mission 30. Mission 30. And September of uh, 2013, just after the wife had died. Mm -hmm. Yep. How did you like it? I loved it. That's when I came back on that flight and I said, I got time. I'm mm -hmm. going to give them time. Yeah. That man upstairs isn't ready for me yet. He hasn't closed the book on me, so I've got something to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I admit, I, I had to go myself the first time. And then I found out that they you could use volunteers, so I signed up and went as a volunteer. And I go at every flight in a Saturday morning. I'm up there by three thirty, and every uh, Sunday I'm up there by ten o'clock, thereabouts for the homecoming. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I I just enjoy it. Like they, uh, a lot of people on the end of flights say, "You're a walking World War II veteran." If you can come, we'd appreciate it. Mm -hmm. We could use you. And uh, so I go to everything. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. Okay, I got some questions for you. <laughs> Had you ever been away from home before you went into the service? No. No? That's the furthest? Well, the I first went to home? a summer camp at the YMCA camp. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but that was for uh, a week or two. And that was just. You don't figure that's a, you're that far away from home, you're not away. Right. You're just a little boy, so. Yeah. But other than that, no. No. <clears throat> that had to be, that had to be an adjustment in itself going halfway around the I world. I tell people it's a learning experience. Yeah. <laughs> you learn how to fold clothes, how to wash clothes, how to sew them. You're learning. Yeah. Mother isn't there anymore right. and the sergeant isn't that old a sergeant that he knows an awful lot. Yeah. He's still learning. Did it take you any any kind of effort to get used to military life? No, I seemed to fall into it easily. Mm-hmm. I uh, uh, enjoyed it, like playing cops and robber, or cowboys and Indians as a little boy. Mm-hmm. I, I fell into it and I took to it the uh, rifle range. I made marksman. Uh, nothing. I just swallowed it and went along. Good. Good. Um, was there, you said your brother was, he was drafted? He was drafted. He ended up as a mechanic on P-38s. Mm -hmm. And he ended up in the Pacific too, but we never could. Join up? We never could get together, mm -hmm. mostly because I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, he could, he, I changed, I was never in one place very long. So right. He couldn't catch up with me. Uh huh. Had your father been in the service at all? No, no? he had been. He had uh, enlisted or was drafted. I don't know World War One. He had got to the docks. They were boarding the ship mm -hmm. when the armistice was signed. Okay, and that's how quick he he was back out of it. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know how long he was in, but he did. He was in it, and he got back out of it before he ever left the shores. Right, that's good. Yeah, that's good. And do you remember what you were doing when the attack happened at Pearl Harbor? We were at home, that was a Sunday night, and uh, we were listening, to, I think, the, the old revival hour on radio. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I think they uh, interrupted the program to announce it on the radio. And. Uh, then, of course, mother and dad were there, <coughs> and they had to explain <coughs> a lot. Mm -hmm. 
and then about the war and everything. So. So you went through the rationing and the blackouts and yep. all that. Yep. Were you scared as a, a young person? I was a. Uh, <laughs> I had a Schwinn bicycle, and I became a uh, messenger between where uh, the fire, the police station was and the fire station to the high school where the office was. Mm -hmm. I'd ride my bike back and forth for messages. And I had to take a piece of tape and put it across my headlight on the bike and the front fender so it was just a slot. Mm -hmm. And then I just turned the back light right off. Yeah. But that was a messenger. Whenever a drill came, uh, You'd always report up to the school, and then they'd send messages down to the police station and the fire station. Or I'd just ride my bike up and down Lake Avenue. Yeah, unbelievable. Did you did you help collect tin or any of that stuff? No, no, no I didn't. Uh, but we you never wasted anything. I right. remember my father, and mother, if they bought cans of anything. The cans were saved. Yeah, yeah. And they, that. That's something they did. I I wasn't involved in that. Mm -hmm. But I already remember they took the paper off the cans. Mm -hmm. Remember the uh, Campbell soups or anything? They took the paper off and just saved the can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had friends when you were in the service. Did you keep in touch with any of them? I did. The the first scout. I kept in touch with him, <coughs> and unfortunately. He lived up in New um, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and I uh, one one year I quit getting any letters, birthday or Christmas. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got in touch with the town hall of the town where he lived, and a hurricane had gone through his street and took his side of town, and his house was demolished, uh -huh. one of many, and that was back in the '60s. Yeah. And they could find no trace of him, huh. and they just assumed that he uh, he got killed in the. Uh, mm -hmm. And he went through the war, and he went through hell, mm -hmm. and then he comes home and Good uh, Lord. dies in that. When you were when you were overseas in these different places, were you able to travel around and see things? No, not until we got to uh, Matsuyama in Japan. Mm -hmm. Other than that, we stayed. Is a group, a company. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now I was in uh, the 34th Battalion, which was attached to the 24th Division. Mm -hmm. The 24th had lost a battalion in World War One, so this was being <coughs> excuse me was being made up. So since then. I've tried to connect the 24th Division, but because I wasn't part of the original, mm -hmm. they, I'm not accepted as the 24th Division. I'm, uh, we used to call ourselves the Bastard Outfit. <laughs> that was the, the nickname for the, 20, uh, the uh, 34th Battalion. Yeah. Yeah, so. When you, when you went to the Philippines, you had to get ready for jungle life. What did they teach you? Did they teach you about snakes and lizards? And yeah, things? and to wear leggings. You always tuck your pants in your leggings. Uh, and always wear long sleeves. And uh, were, you, did they, were you concerned about malaria? All I had, I got malaria. You got malaria? <laughs> in fact, I had malaria so bad at one place that uh, in one of the Philippine islands, that I ended up in the hospital, and uh, the uh, doctor was coming through making his checks one day, and he says, uh, you're going to be my ward boy. I said, I'm what? And he says, you're the healthiest one in this tent. He says, you're going to be the ward boy. He taught me how to give shots. Mm -hmm. On the back of your rear end, there's an indentation on your cheek of your rear, and he took them thylate and drew a square, and he says, that's where the shot goes. I said, what? He says, that's where the shot goes. And then he taught me to read the the uh, paperwork, where tell about the shot. And uh, he went with me a couple of times, but he was busy enough, because it was, uh, the tent had three different, three different tents, really. Mm -hmm. So he was busy enough. So he taught me for about two or three days until the real board boy, he was sick. 
until he got better and he came and relieved me. So I, that was my first taste of medicine. Yeah. And as soon as I got home, I joined the ambulance. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. So it did some good to me. It taught me something anyway. Right. Yeah. So now we're going to go to um, this bazooka. How do you learn to shoot a bazooka? You, well, there's got to be two of you. You get a long tube, right. you put it on your shoulder, you aim it, and the guy behind you puts it, the uh, shell in. Okay. And taps you on the shoulder, you're ready to go. Now, you, you've, got an, you've got a sight. Where, do, does somebody carry these shells for you? Oh, yeah. I mean, you can't carry this thing yeah. in these shells. Well, generally, with a bazooka, you get in one spot, you stay there. Okay. You, maybe if they're advancing to you or something. But you don't have really have any protection. Mm -hmm. You carry a forty-five on your hip, but by the time you got rid of the bazooka off your shoulder and tried to pull a forty-five, you're dead. How far? How far do you shoot this bazooka? Uh, they'll go quite a distance. Yeah. Uh, basically, what you use them on, if you find a tank or if you want find a uh, any stronghold that you can't break through, they'd be ideal for that. And I shot them maybe two shells and I decided there was no, this wasn't for me. <laughs> I don't and that's when Pappy asked me, he said, would you like to try the flamethrower? Because we were still in training and we were, before we made New Guinea. Right. And I said, yeah, what the heck? Well, again, you don't have any protection. Yeah. And once uh, you use that, if they see you coming with that tank in your back, you're, you're a dead duck. Now, what, what would you use a flamethrower for? I've seen that. On television, where you, you, if they're in tunnels and stuff, you would use. Well, them even more. in the past. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, you don't have any. You can't even take a forty-five and put it on your hip because you got the tanks there. Right. So you you, you don't have anything but that flamethrower on your shoulders. Uh huh. And uh, it, it's it's weight. It's I can see it in Okinawa and some of those. But we didn't run across any any. Uh, uh, mountains or anything to where they were hiding in caves. We didn't run into that. Uh -huh. And when we got to Mindanao and Medora, it was like a sweep up. They were all, they had moved out of the towns and uh, <coughs> gone into the jungle. So we had to go and flush them out. And they didn't, they didn't want to be flushed out. They'd fight. But uh, Excuse me. I I enjoyed once I got to Thompson. I felt as I had protection for myself. Good. The Thompson was your favorite, huh? Yes. You yep. felt like you were. That was my baby. That was your baby. We got into Japan, and uh, when we were in Matsuyama, we were going to be shipped out. And they told us we had to go over to general headquarters to exchange any monies. And it was it was December seventh, mm -hmm. and they issued us guns to walk that couple of blocks because it was a holiday to the Japanese. Right. To them, it was a holiday. Right. So we, in turn, uh, they issued our weapons to us, and I asked them if I could have my Thompson. I said, I feel better with it. I know that baby. So they let me carry that over to General Headquarters where we exchanged her. And it was about 15 or 20 of us who went over. Had you ever been familiar with guns before you went into the no. service? No hunting? Just a cap gun. Yeah. Just a little kid. Yeah. But uh, no, I had no. Uh -huh. And I don't have guns in the house now. Uh -huh. I did uh, at one time in. Uh, I don't remember what island I uh, were on patrol and they, we heard Japanese talking ahead of us so we hit the ground and I was behind a tree and they came walking down and they were jabbing. I mean, you go on patrol, you, do, you don't talk. And they were talking and uh, I just laid and there was what turned out to be a general and I took my tops and cut him right up the middle. From the bottom, from the bottom to the top. Yeah. And the uh, general, the uh, whoever was behind them, another Jap. The rest of them were behind them. They turned around and ran. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got his saber and his pistol. 
but the saber was a, it was gold mm -hmm. and it had a lot of Japanese lettering on it. So I was told that has to go to general headquarters. That you never got it. I never got it. Never got it. I did pick up a uh, saber later, but uh, when I got aboard ship coming home, somebody has wiped it on me. Oh. So I said, well, fair, fair is fair. I went and looked around and I found a, a uh, rifle, mm -hmm. a carbine. And uh, they'd, I thought they'd all been dumped at sea. That's what they told us, that, but somebody had gotten one. The Cosmoline was still in the bore of the rifle. And the uh, bayonet was made on the rifle. Mm -hmm. So you could flip it open. Mm -hmm. So I brought that home along with a Harry Carey knife. And uh, after years, I decided I don't want that rifle. So a fellow down the street who was the fire chief of the local fire department here, I gave it to him. Because he, he had lots of rifles and he loved them. He, in turn, cleaned it up and somehow found ammunition for it and went down to Mount Morris where his daughter, sister at the time had a farm. And he came back and he says, that's the most accurate gun I've ever shot in my life. Mm -hmm. He says, I bet it was 500 feet away from a tree and I took the twig and cut it right back. Every that's shot. That's Carby. Yeah. Yeah. He said it was the best. So he still got it. Mm -hmm. Now his son wants it. <laughs> I don't blame him. I don't blame yeah. him. My husband collects um, military weapons and, yeah. and he's got carbines and he's got the M1 Grands. Yeah. And they're, I love I love shooting the carbine. It's a nice shooting. You carbine. like the because uh, Dave told me that it doesn't have a lot of kick. No, no. Carbine, but right he right on. You know. He found ammunition for it, and mm -hmm. uh, then he went down there and tried it out. And they're wonderful little yeah. guns. Yeah, they're wonderful. Okay. Um. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, when you went when you went to the islands. What what were you on? Were you on an LST? Yeah, well, we were on a full ship. A full and ship. And then we landed, went off the side, down the uh, okay. rope ladders, and got into the landing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, craft. we did that in uh, New Guinea in uh, Leyte. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't know if it was Mindoro or Mindanao. They had piers that we landed on there. Okay. That was that was a more of a mop up. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, they, the Filipino people told us that the Japs had only maybe an hour ago left the town. Mm -hmm. they, now when you were in Lakey, did they, when you were getting off the big ship, were they shooting at you? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Lakey was a uh, full, full operation landing. Yeah. So was New Guinea. They were the two major ones. Mm -hmm. The rest were, uh, like I say, when we went to the Coral Islands, that was nothing. It was probably, I, as far as I could know, we never left where we landed. Yeah. And uh, the patrols that went out come back, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. they were so. Now this Pappy, Pappy Pyle, <laughs> sounds like you really respected him a lot. Yes. Can you tell me about him? Um, as long as everything <clears throat> went along smooth and your patrols were running smooth and there was no problems. You didn't, he didn't bother you. Mm -hmm. uh, you could, uh, you, your day off, you could do what you wanted. There wasn't any place you could go, just lay in your cot. But uh, he, he would just lay back. He was easy going, you could talk to him. He was, uh, I guess you'd call him a fatherly type. Mm -hmm. He was there for anybody that uh, wanted to talk to him, and he went on patrols occasionally. He didn't go on all of them. There's a rule of sergeant or a lieutenant would be with you. But uh, we were on, uh, we had gone out on one patrol when we got uh, tied down with jabs. And uh, our sergeant at that time was a uh, tall fellow from, I think, in the Virginia Hills. He wore a huge shoe, and um, we'd had some new guys, recruits come in, and I don't remember what island was on, but uh, 
he wanted to draw their fire. And he said, well, I'm gonna run across this opening, draw their fire and you guys shoot them. Shoot as they stand up. Well, we had about five new recruits. Well, he ran across the opening and the, the old timers were the only ones that did any shooting. And then he came back again. He said, I'm going to do it once more and I want all of you to shoot. Not just, you know, the, the uh, scouts and everybody, everybody. But he never made it across the second time. Really? He withdrew the fire. <clears throat> and, uh, they must have expected it. So uh, we finally did secure and move ahead, but mm -hmm. we lost him. And I went out of the patrol, we lost the whole patrol behind us. That's when I was in the uh, jungle for a couple of days. But mm -hmm. they, like I said before, they were too far behind. They should have been closer to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, when you were in Vietnam, when they were in the jungle, they could call for somebody and they'd come in helicopters. When you were in the jungle, you were on your own yeah. until you got yourself out of yeah. there. Yeah. On a couple of occasions when we had opening where we weren't in the jungle itself, mm -hmm. <laughs> we called for air support. And I hate to say it, but every time they called for Army, the Army Air Corps come in, they missed the target. You call for the Marine support, they came in, hit that target on the eye every time. Yeah. They never missed. You, I've heard that before. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. The, uh, the Marine Corps came in and you could depend on them, mm -hmm. taking out any point that you wanted. Fortunately, we didn't use them that often, but there was a few times when we did. Uh, mm -hmm. We did use them. God bless those marine pilots. Yeah. That's something. Okay. Um, what's your opinion of of all volunteer army versus a draft army? The volunteer army is the ones that want to. The draftees, a lot of them don't want to. Mm -hmm. And they're going in there with bad feelings. But you, you've still, if you've got a, a, a war coming out or something, you've got to have your your services. And if, that's, if you're not going to get the volunteers, you've got to draft them. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's always, <clears throat> there's always that many of us that will volunteer mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. go right at it. <clears throat> uh, that one time I lost, we lost a sergeant. I was asked to take over, and they said, "No, I won't." No. no I'm the first scout. That's it. I, I got my job, and I don't want to be responsible. So mm -hmm. they found somebody else. And okay. Now, what do you think about women being in the service? Fine. Okay. If they think they can do it, let them go. Mm -hmm. Some of them are damn good uh, soldiers. Mm -hmm. Even Navy. And they can do the job. Look at the, the Navy now. It's got one of the women's gone right up the ladder. Mm -hmm. And I imagine she writes and runs a tight ship. I imagine she yeah. does. So no, if they want to, they want to get in. Let them go. Mm -hmm. I know you got to have separate quarters for them, but there's uh, that that should be easy enough to do. Right. Do you think they should be on the front line? Only if they actually want to. Yeah. If uh, you've got these, what are they, tomboys, they call them, mm -hmm. if they want to, sure, let them go. Mm -hmm. You're not forcing them to go, they're going on their own. They mm -hmm. want to go, let them go. Okay. They may make damn good soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. Because they want to. Mm hmm. If a young person came up to you and was asking about going into the service because he's contemplating doing it himself, what kind of advice would you give? Huh? If a young person came to you and, and wanted to know about the service because he was thinking about going in, what kind of advice would you give him? If, if he's serious and he, he, he can stomach and take it, go on. Mm -hmm. It's a good learning. It's like some of the countries over Europe. They, every every household has a gun, and mm -hmm. every everybody gets at least a year or two years of training, and I think they all should. Do you think every kid that graduates from high school should get that kind of discipline? some military training? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would hurt them. 
I don't think so either. It would be a, a benefit mm. to him too. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. I think a lot of a lot of veterans feel the same way. They think that it would teach them discipline and yeah. and organization and focus and the yeah. whole thing. Yeah, I can't say that I disagree at all. Well, it may be a year, maybe two years at the most. Say, yeah. and they they have to, they'll come out a different because they'll go in and they'll learn. Yeah. And yeah. There's a lot to be uh, a lot of teaching to be done. Did you, when you got out of the service, did you join any of the organizations like VFW? No. 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 Uh, later years, I went to the v local VFW, but uh, they didn't have a meeting such as a meeting. They didn't have a, a reading of the minutes, or they didn't have a treasurer's report or nothing. There was a, a drinking time, and I said, oh, heck with this. Yeah. I stayed in for two meetings, and I said, well, they don't, this is just a beer beer time right right did you use the gi bill uh for my first home right yeah. um when when you went in the service and you learned the things you did did it affect your career when you came out no i think it was a benefit to me because mm -hmm. at that time when i left kodak where I was working, I was a messenger out of research labs. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, I went into shipping, and then I went into trucking. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I learned a lot in the service that helped me through to get along with people. And you don't you don't argue with your fellow worker. And in the service, you don't argue with anybody because you can depend on them to protect you as right. well as you protect them. Right. So you have to be on the good side of everybody. You don't make enemies out of anybody. When you got out of the service, was it hard to adjust back into civilian life? Uh, I, no. I, I, I didn't lay around. I got out in the street and played football with the kids and everything else for about two weeks. And uh, then I went back to Kodak. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did have a carryover of malaria. Mm -hmm. But uh, does that last forever? No. No. They about two years. They gave me a monthly uh, check, and then they stopped it. Mm -hmm. And my doctor that I was going to at the time, uh, he says, I can understand it. You've got no show of it at all. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. What was your proudest moment when you were in the service? Uh, I, <laughs> I, was, I was proud when I, like I told you about the peaches and pears when I gave them to the Filipinos, mm -hmm. that they had never seen, never had, tasted it. And I was just so darn proud that my dad had thought of it mm -hmm. and sent it to me and I'd given it to them and I, I just kind of strutted around. <laughs> It was, a, it was just a good moment that you could help somebody and show them something that they had never never thought of. Right. Yeah. Right. The old, the old ball jars. <laughs> yeah. But he had thought of it. He'd, he'd got the uh, uh, Italian bread, took it all out from the inside, put the small jar, just a small jar, mm -hmm. and packed it with the... Uh, the bread, and he cut it in half, and he sent me two of them in a box. And it stayed? Full of newspapers. <clears throat> That's good. Yeah. That's good thinking. Now, were you in Japan, or when they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, Nagasaki? We were in Japan at the no. time. We were in the Philippines. You were in the Philippines? Yeah. What did you think of that? Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Stop the war. First of all, when I first went in, it was kill or be killed. Yeah. Now you don't. Go, you're not going to kill anymore. Yeah. And it's a big weight off of your shoulders. Right. Right. You're not going to have to kill anymore. Although we still had to go. We went on patrol. Mm -hmm. And I, I, we did. At one point, somebody took a Japanese. Was after the war, and he had been educated in the University of California, I believe, or San Diego. Need an American education, mm -hmm. 
But believe it or not, he was just a peon. He wasn't an officer in the uh, no. Japanese army. He was just a soldier. Yeah. <clears throat> Unbelievable. When you got out of the service and you joined the ambulance corps and you joined the fire department, what fire department do you belong to? Barnard. Barnard? I'm a life member. Mm -hmm. And after I was in for uh, eight and a half years, I had back trouble, so I left them and another ambulance car was just starting up. They were a year old, so I joined them as a dispatcher. Mm -hmm. But I still had to have first aid, because if somebody came yeah. in while the ambulance is out, you've got to treat them. Right. So I've always had, uh, in fact, <laughs> off the, all, all, not to do with the Army, but I delivered three babies. Did you really? Before I ever had a first aid class. Unbelievable. <laughs> I was in the ambulance car for about two years before the American Red Cross uh -huh. started first aid. Feet first and two naturals. And, Good for uh, you. You know what you do? Help. Yeah, really. And he does. Yeah. He does. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I believe that he's got a book on me and he hasn't closed the cover yet. I hope not for a long time. You also were involved in scouting. Yep. These are two things, the fire department and scouting are dear to my heart. My yep. husband's a fireman, my kids are firemen, my boys were scouts, I was a scout leader. <laughs> I, I did all that and I never went to Massaweepi, but the boys went to Massaweepi. You know, yeah. And you went to Massaweepi. Yeah. Loved so, it. Were you a scout when you were a child? A uh, very short time, it didn't yeah. last long. Yeah. Well, that back then it was hard to do it. Well, know. I had to go from where I lived up here at Dewey Stone all the way up to by Judge Motors, okay. Lake Avenue Baptist Church. Uh huh. And that's where I had to take a bus uh -huh. and then transfer to the trolley and go up there. And well, that's a long way. Yeah. Yeah. But it was our church, and that's where the scout troop was. Uh huh. Then I used to walk from there all the way down to where my dad worked at the YMCA, so I could come home with him. Yeah. Different world. Yeah. Different yeah. world. Well, then you walk Lake Avenue, you didn't have to worry. Right, right. You were safe from one end to the other. So. You went on honor flight. Mm hmm. Mission, you, mission 30. Mission 30. And you, you volunteer for them now? Now I'm a liaison between the uh, veterans and the honor flight. Mm hmm. Yep. You just keep going, don't you? Hey, if there's somebody that needs to, my help, I'll be there. That's good. That's good. And I love I love working in the hospital because I... Which hospital is it? Unity. Can, Unity? Okay. Yeah. Every time an ambulance comes in, I help them get the patient from their stretcher to ours. I only lift the feet, though. Uh-huh. And if they got to be, if they can get over by themselves, I don't have... I just make sure the room is ready for them and everything. Mm -hmm. But then when an ambulance comes in, I go with them into the room. Now, how often do you do that? Three days a week. Three days a week. Mondays from 10 to 12 and Tuesday and Thursday from 10 to 2 or later. Uh-huh. If ambulances come in, there's been a number of times I've stayed an hour, hour and a half. Don't, don't even register there at the time because I, when I come in in the morning, I sign in from 10 to 2. Mm-hmm. So, but an ambulance, if they start coming in and they're getting real busy and I have time to go home, I'll stay. Right, right. Come ahead. Every ambulance that comes in, they, they all know me. That's good. Because uh, when I remember, when I rode an ambulance, nobody ever helped you. Yeah. You, you took a patient in, put them in a bed, you had to get them over yourself. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, I have no more questions for you, but if you have something else you'd like to share, no, I have uh, enjoyed my life. I'm willing to help anybody and everybody. I, now, do you have a family? Uh, my first wife and I got divorced. My two sons left me because they wouldn't have anything to do with my second wife. Mm -hmm. Her two daughters left us because they wanted to borrow money, but they wouldn't sign IOUs. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't let them take money. So we right. have nothing to do with them. Right. So she and I, God bless her, uh, we've kind of adopted. 
Uh, this gentleman down the street used to be the fire chief. His oldest son is like a grandson to me. Uh -huh. And I met a nurse in the hospital many years ago. And I told my wife, I said, you got to meet her. She's got the most wonderful laugh in the world. And she's, she's so great. She's my daughter. Uh -huh. In fact, they're on my will. Yeah. Two of them. Very nice. Very I have nice. a grandson on my wife's side who's in the Navy. And he's on the Nimitz. Mm -hmm. He just made CPO. And he's very, very proud of uh, the Navy. And I, I encourage him now. He told me the last time I talked to him that he's been signed up for a th complete 30 years. Uh -huh. He's got, I think, 13 years in now. He's going for the, the complete 30. Well, let's hope they love Like us. he says, Grandpa, there's nothing outside. There's no work out there. Mm -hmm. I'm in computers. Right. There's no work, so I might as well stay here and yeah. do what I can. Yeah. Well, hopefully they'll let him. They'll let him. Well, he's already signed. He's committed for 30 years. Uh-huh. So he's tickled me. Good for him. Good. Yep. So, well, I have nothing else. So I hope you, this has gone over. It is. It's been good. Good. It's been good. I want to thank you for your service. Well, I like to. I tell everybody when they say that it was. I learned. Mm -hmm. I went in there as a dumb little kid, and I come out with some knowledge. No, you certainly did. Yeah. Thank you.